So even before we were born, mothers, fathers, our parents uh, already disciplined their, their themselves and their control of appetite and characters even molds the future child. So the preparation that goes way, way before the child even comes prepares the child to fight successfully the battle against evil. It happens way, way before the child is really born. Especially does this responsibility bear or rest upon the mother. She by whose life blood the child is nourished and its physical frame built up imparts to the child, mental and spiritual influences that tend to the shaping of the mind and the character. It was Moses' mother, Jochebed, Jochebed who strong in faith was not afraid of the king's commandments, of whom was born Moses, the deliverer of Israel. It was Hannah the woman of prayer and self-sacrifice and heavenly inspiration who gave birth to Samuel, the heaven-instructed child, the incorruptible judge, the founder of Israel's sacred schools. It was Elizabeth, the kinswoman and kindred spirit of Mary of Nazareth, who was the mother of the Savior of the world. The New York Daily News on May 9, 2021 ran a justice story, how a mother's hard work and enduring love freed her son from prison. It goes back to the date of October 10, 1944, when an unusual classified ad ran in the Chicago Times. And the, the ad read, $5,000 reward for killers of Officer Lundy on December 9, 1932. Please call GRO 1758 from 12 noon to 7 p.m. And the person who placed this ad was Tilly Majdek. I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly. That's Polish. My Majdek. And a few days later, an article in the New York Daily News described Tilly, a mere, merely another anonymous figure, a gray hill shriveled little woman, nearly 60, who lived in Chicago's dirty backyard area. It's true at the time, Tilly did not have much in the world. She was poor. She was the mother of a convicted cop killer. Her son, Joseph, was convicted. But the truth is, it was a wrong, wrongful, conviction, as you will see. But Tilly had one thing to hold on to. She had the belief that Joe or Joseph was innocent. And in her heart, she knew her boy could not have committed this horrible crime. So she fought for him in the only way she could, by scrubbing floors in office buildings at night. She did this for 11 and a half years, scrubbing floors and saving every penny. And when Tilly talked,
job. She had accumulated enough cash to jog a memory of what happened 11 years ago. She placed the ad in the newspaper. So there goes 5,000 reward. So here is Stateville Prison in Joliet, Illinois, where her son Joseph Maschek was housed. The ad caught the eye of the Chicago Times editor, who sent an experienced crime reporter by the name of James McGuire to find out what this ad is all about. Just a little ad, but it caught the eye of the editor of the Times. Usually moms often turn a blind eye when a much-loved child's child goes back, right? But in this case, it looked like Tilly had more than just a mother's love and faith in her son. She had some promising leads. So the incident, the shooting happened on a cold night in 1932. Patrolman Police William D. Lundy, Lundy, age 57, had stopped in this delicatessen called Vera's Kitchen on 4212 South Ashland. And at that time, two men burst into the, to the store, to this delicatessen, and then there was a scuffle, a fight. And then there were sounds of gunfire and the robber, robbers fled as the patrolman Lundy fell mortally wounded. He died. The policeman died. Later on, the store owner incorrectly thought she recognized the robber. And after a lengthy police interrogation, she changed her mind. And this led to the wrongful indictment of Joseph Maschek and his friend Ted Marcinskiewicz. What is his name? Both of which were to be found innocent many years later. But nevertheless, on November 11, 1932, Joseph Maschek and Ted Marcinskiewicz were wrongfully sentenced to 99 years in prison each one of them. And the story soon faded from the pages of the newspaper. Years passed, the Great Depression ended, World War II began, and through it all, Tilly quietly scrubbed the floor. For how many years? Eleven and a half years. Waiting and saving. That is what is called a mother's love and dedication. One of the headlines in the Associated Press story says, Char woman offers $5,000 to free son. And this story ran throughout the country in October 1944. The story told how Tilly toiled night after night, pouring every penny as well as the allotment paid from another son in the army. She was getting paid. She put it in a little fund called her Freedom Fund. And when the editor of the Times, Mr. McGuire, came to her door, she handed a 30-page document that her son had typed type out while she, he is behind bars. And in that paper was uh, all of the facts, and sure enough, the Times investigation uncovered evidence that the man, that, that the man had not gotten a fair trial. And evidence shows there is coerced false identification 
by the key witness, the store owner herself made wrongful uh, identification. So on August 17, 1945, the news was among many pages that covered the outcome of this classified ad. In the picture, you can see leaving the prison complex, Tilly in the middle, second from the right. Next to her in the middle is Joseph, second from the left. And then Joseph's son, Junior, in the far left. And in the far right is Helen, Joseph's former wife. She divorced him when he was in jail. But later on, he remarried her. So she had to abandon her second marriage and go back to get married to Joe. So another headline in uh, a paper says, Back home with mom who won his freedom. A photo of Tilly and Joe beaming at one another. Joe Maschek had his first home-cooked breakfast in 11 years today. He ate heartily, trying to make up for 4,196 breakfasts that he had eaten while serving a prison sentence for a crime he did not commit. Maschek was granted a full pardon yesterday, it read under the photo. Even better, Tilly was allowed to keep her floor scrubbing money. She offered the $5,000 reward to the newspaper editors, but they declined to take cash for a story that they viewed as a public service. An editorial in the Dayton Daily News noted, possibly we shall hold a special place in the Hall of Mothers for Mrs. Maschek. For while the mothers of soldiers waited in comradeship together, mothers and mothers, in the glare of public adulation for their boys, this mother stood alone before the world and fought for a social outcast. So in 1947, the state gave Joe $24,000 compensation, which today amounts to close to $351,000 for the wrongful conviction. And his friend, Ted Marcin's Kiewicz, was later pardoned also five years later and received $35,000. So that's probably close to $450,000 uh, dollars today. And Hollywood picked up on the story of this one mother's devotion. And it became, in uh, 1949, a classic film called Call Northside 777, starring James Stewart as the reporter who followed up on the case. After that, Tilly continued to work the night shift scrubbing floors until her retirement in 1957, after 30 years on the job. And when she died in 1964, newspapers all over the country carried the obituary. Headlines hailed her as the Northside 77 heroine and the valiant mom who freed herself. We know also another woman who also worked hard. She was a slave. Her name was Yokeb, mother of Moses. Her lot in life was humble, her burden heavy, but through no other woman except Mary of Nazareth has the world received so great a blessing. So besides, uh, besides Mary, uh, Mother of Jesus, there's no other uh, 
person that uh, has blessed the world so much as the mother of Moses. Knowing that her child must soon pass beyond her care, she only had 12 years to take care of her child. And her child will be passed on to the guardianship of those who do not know God. Moses' mother, the more earnestly endeavored to link his soul with heaven, she sought to impart his heart, love, and loyalty to God. And faithfully was the work accomplished. Those principles of truth that were the burden of his mother's teaching and the lesson of her life, no after influence could induce Moses to renounce. So from the humble home in Goshen, Moses, the son of Yochebed, passed to the palace of the Pharaohs, to the Egyptian princess, by her to become welcome as a loved and cherished son. Younger than Joseph and Daniel was Moses when he was removed from the sheltering care of his childhood home. Yet, already the same agencies that shaped their lives had molded his. Only 12 years did he spend with his Hebrew mother and kindred. But during those years, the foundation of his greatness was laid. It was laid by the hand of one little known to fame, his own mother. So mothers, you might not, not be known to fame, you might be just working quietly in the house, but your influence reached far all the way, even to Pharaoh's court, and all the way to eternity. Here we see another far-reaching influence of mother's love and care in the shaping of the life of a gentleman, a Scottish doctor named William Patton Mackay, who later on became a Presbyterian minister and is also known as the author of the hymn, Revive Us Again, and we will be singing that song later on. Dr. Uh, Mackay, William Patton McKay was born in May 13, 1839 in Montrose, Scotland. He died in August 22, 1885 in Portree, Scotland. He graduated from the University of Edinburgh and worked as a doctor. And here is his re remarkable conversion story as published in the British Evangelist in January 1879. He said, my dear mother had been a godly, holy woman, and quite often telling me to the Savior. And many times I saw her on bended knee in prayer for my soul's salvation. But nothing had made a deep impression on me. The older I grew, the more wicked I became. One day, while I was working, a seriously injured patient was brought into the hospital. His case, his case seemed hopeless. He might die anytime soon. He seemed, the patient seems to realize about his serious condition and the nearness of his time. He was fully conscious about the end. And he asked me how much time he had left to live. I gave him my honest opinion as cautious a manner as I could. And then I asked him, Sir, do you have any relatives whom we can, we can notify? That's what we have to prepare when people are ready to die. You have to ask, do you have any family members that I can, you know, prepare so that everything can go smoothly? Mm -hmm. The patient shook his head. He had, he doesn't have much, um, 
many, not any members of his family around. But he had only one wish. It was to see his landlady because he owed her a small sum of money and he also wished to bid her farewell. He also requested that his landlady send him the book. The book. So I went to see him on my regular visits every day. I check on him, do my rounds in the hospital. I check on this patient at least once a day. But what struck me most was the quiet, almost happy expression constantly on his face. And after that man died, some things about his affairs were to be done in my presence. So the nurse holding up a book in her hand says, Doc, so what are we going to do about this? I asked her, what kind of book is that? Oh, it's the Bible of the poor man. As long as he was able to read it, he did it. But when he was unable to do to read anymore, he kept it under his bed cover. I took the Bible and I opened it and I couldn't trust my eyes. It was my own Bible. It was the Bible which my mother had given me many years ago when I left my parents' home. And which later on, when I was short of money, I pawned, I sold the Bible in a pawn shop so that I can buy my whiskey. My name was written in it, written by my mother's hand. And there was a little verse right underneath her, her, her name. With deep sense of shame, I looked upon the precious book. It had given comfort and refreshing to this unfortunate man in his last hours. It had been a guide to him into eternal life so that he had been enabled to die in peace and happiness. And this book, the last gift to me from my mother, I had actually sold for a ridiculously low price. Be it sufficient to say that the regained possession of my Bible was the cause of my And so overwhelmed, William, William Patton McKay slipped the Bible under his coat and rushed back to his private office. It was there in that office that the doctor, who had become a wicked, infidel, and atheist, fell to his knees praying that God would have mercy on him and save him. He asked God to for, forgive him for his sinful life. And as he prayed, he remembered a verse his mother taught him long ago, God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah, Dr. McKay immediately contacted his mother to tell her of his salvation and how God used the Bible she gave him to dramatically answer her prayers. In due time, McKay's life proved that which is written in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, which says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. By the grace of God, William Patton McKay, a world-renowned doctor, went on to become a Presbyterian minister, preacher, well-known author and songwriter. And it was from his pen that we received the beautiful hymn, We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. We 
We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. We praise thee, O God, for the joy thou hast given to thy saints in communion this foretaste of heaven. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine be glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine be glory. Revive us again. And in his paper called Ye Must Be Born Again, Dr. McKay wrote, Jesus did all the saving work. He brought the cross to our level. Get saved by looking to him. Lie down as wounded, helpless, ungodly sinner and look away from yourself to Jesus. Wow, what a work of a mother that changed her son. Thank God for giving us mothers. Praise God for giving Eve as the grandmother of all living. Genesis 3 verse 20 says, The man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. Yes, Adam gave the name the living one, Eve, to his wife in faith, seeing in her the mother of all living. At the time when his death sentence had just been Pronounce. But Adam looked beyond the grave and saw in the seed promised to his wife the one who would restore him and his descendants to immortality, where the land of all the living, the immortality that he forfeited that day. But you and I are given this gift. One day we will be immortal. Because there is Eve, the mother of all the living. Exodus 20 verse 12 says, Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long, full life in the Lord your God, that the Lord your God has given you. It is by beholding the love in our parents that we children are led to obey the fifth commandment and to heed the injunction. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. When a mother has gained the confidence of her children and taught them to love and obey her, she has given them the first lesson in the Christian life. They must love and trust and obey their Savior as they love and trust and obey their parents. The love which in faithful care and right training the parent manifests for the child Bentley mirrors the love of Jesus for his faithful people. Proverbs 29, 15 says, To discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced when an when by an undisciplined child. Isaiah 49, verse 14 and 15 says, Jerusalem says, The Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. Never. Never. Can a, mother, can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were even possible, I, God, would never forget you. The strongest love known to human beings is that of a mother's love for her child. And this love Isaiah uses to illustrate the love of God for his people. Wow. And lastly, Isaiah 66 verse 13 says, I will comfort you there in Jerusalem. One day we will be home in Jerusalem and we will be comforted as a mother comforts her child. Wow. God really marks the love of a mother as a symbol of his own love. 
Happy is the child in whom such words as this awaken love and gratitude and trust. The child to whom the tenderness and justice and long suffering of parents, teachers, interpret the love and justice and long suffering of God. They emulate the love of God as parents. Happy is the child who, by trust and submission and reverence toward his earthly parents, protectors, learn also to trust and obey and reverence his God. And he who imparts to child or pupil such a gift of faith has endowed, endowed the child with a treasure more precious than the wealth of all the ages. A treasure as enduring as eternity. Wow, what an amazing role mothers and also fathers have for the salvation of our children. Thank you, Lord, for mother. Happy Mother's Day.